You know, the uh, Travis was just uh, reading from uh, some information on our website, and uh, it's interesting as he was, as as he was uh, speaking. It made me think that you know we really wrote that about uh, uh, probably close to eight years ago, and it said. Uh, you know, our, our liberties are slowly eroding away. And, um, you know, I think we need to change that to our liberties uh, have quickly eroded away. Not only in the past tense, but the fact that it's moving much quicker. Um, you know, it really was at a point where, you know, things were moving slowly. And it's amazing to see what I have seen just in the last... Um, Boy, in the last seven to eight years, how things have progressed much, much quicker. I'll talk about that a little bit today. And I'll tell you a little bit about Advocates for Faith and Freedom. We're a, we're a nonprofit religious liberty law firm. This kind of quickest way to, you know, encapsulize who we are and what we do. Um, I understand Point Man Ministries meets here. How many of you are from Point Man? And you guys are veterans, right? Yes. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your service. Thank you for standing up uh, for our religious liberties here and abroad and for democracy and for the values that America stands for. Um, and, you know, uh, unfortunately, I'm going to move this here. So, sorry, I'm not you know, dancing here a little weird. You know, thank you for what you guys have done because... Um, you know, if it wasn't for our, uh, our, our rich heritage in Christian history and our soldiers who've gone off to defend our liberties, we wouldn't be here today. Yeah, how many of you are from Trinity in the room? Okay. And how many of you are, the rest of you are not? Raise your hand just so I can get a picture of, wow, that's great. So half of you come from elsewhere. And you know what? That, that is, uh, how many of you look at this and say, boy, this is unique. We're in a we're in a bit right. We're in a business. We we are in a business park. It's a business day. It's you know nine ten in the morning, and we're singing worship songs. Uh, isn't that great? You know where else do you see this sort of thing happening in the United States? Boy, few and far between. Unless you were working in a church a non-profit religious ministry you just don't see this it's very unique it's odd and um, it wasn't so odd you know years ago I mean this this was just a this was standard practice for most communities in, in, in government in you know prayer it was something that businesses did all the time. You know, businessmen like uh, John Adams and, 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 and all our founding fathers, they got together with their, they, they prayed over what they did. And, uh, and, and so this is encouraging. This is exciting to be a part of this movement. And um, I, I presume you guys have, uh, you, you know about um, the the ministry tent makers that Paul and some of the guys down in, Tem in, in Temecula or Marietta have, have launched, tent makers ministries, to try to encourage the, the businesses, Christians, to use their business as a platform to exercise their faith and to share the gospel. And um, so, you know, great things are happening here. And, and, and Lord willing, it's going to happen and it's going to spread beyond just this this location just outside of Trinity it's exciting to see uh, going to some of the tent maker ministry meetings that I've been able to be at lots of Christian business owners coming together and starting to say you know boy we could we can use our business as a platform and and going out and doing it there was a uh, a tattoo parlor Christian business owner started a Bible study in Temecula at his tattoo parlor. Kids coming, you know, all these people all tatted up, Christians serving the Lord. Isn't that great? Um, where else are you able to do that but America? You know, um, 
as I as I sit here and I think about uh, about what's going on in the rest of the world, there are some pretty neat movements going on in South Korea. They're sending out Christians all over the place, which is really exciting, and um, lots of missionaries being sent out there. And and I hear of some of you know countries like Belize. Uh, one of our board members is headed down to Belize. Um, he is a um, superintendent of Christian schools at, at Calvary Chapel Christian School and, and uh, Des, who's, who's heading out, he was asked to go down because the Belizean government would like him to come down and put on seminars for teachers for Christian education in the Belizean public schools. Isn't that amazing? Um, we go down to Haiti and I'm a part of that ministry and 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 what Des does down there is is he there's we're part of this organization called the Haiti Endowment Fund and it was started by a pastor um, who came out of Pomona uh, First Assembly of God years ago and now out of the, this ministry there are uh, 13 schools 16 churches in Haiti in the in the upper plateau region and, and it's amazing what's going on there. And about 4,000 kids are being educated. And every summer, you know, Des goes and puts on this seminar for Christians, for these teachers to come and, and learn how to teach, but not only to learn how to teach, but to be able to teach from a biblical perspective. That's going on in Haiti. You know, the government loves it. They love the fact, because they don't really have public education in Haiti. And so they love the fact that this is what's going on. You see some of these movements going on in these in these struggling countries where they're 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 striving, and, and it's exciting. And um, you know, I want to see that happen in America more. Uh, I want to see businesses doing what you're doing in the public schools embrace Christianity. Let me tell you, uh, what what why do we do what we do at, at Advocates for Faith and Freedom? We take on cases that are um, for example, we're defending marriage in, in the Proposition 8 case. We defend the county of Imperial. And, and we were brought in to, uh, I won't give you all the gory details, but just you understand that these are the kinds of cases we're involved in. Um, back in, 19, in 2004, when the mayor of San Francisco started issuing same-sex marriage licenses, we were there defending Proposition 22, which was the first Defense of Marriage Act passed in California by the voters. And back then, um, I got involved in, and had the opportunity to go and, and defend Proposition 22 and all the way to the California Supreme Court and the mayor ended up putting the, 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 uh, the, the, the court ended up telling the mayor, you gotta stop that, you can't issue same-sex marriage licenses anymore, that's unconstitutional, it's illegal, it violates it violates the people's vote. Well, as you know, eventually the California Supreme Court came back and said, but that's unconstitutional. So you can't, uh, you can't prohibit same-sex marriage. Then we, the people, passed Proposition 8, and then now, as you know, now we're in the federal courts defending Proposition 8 based upon the federal constitution. Um, this is a case that really defends you know who we are as Americans. We're a Christian nation, and and the fact that as 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 Americans we voted. You know it's a democracy. Now whether you are in favor or against same-sex marriage, the fact is is that people of California voted. For for nothing else, we should be defending the the right of the people to decide how to govern themselves. You know there are other nations that would. Uh, have chosen to allow same-sex marriage. Frankly, I look at that and I say, well, if you don't like how our nation has chosen to govern itself, then, then, then move to a nation that would embrace your values instead of trying to overturn how our nation governs itself. But what's happening these days is we're finding a complete shift in our government that they're saying, wait a minute, let us, let us change how we govern ourselves because there are these social issues we want to embrace. And so a minority of, of 
of people who think this way are, are in the court system and they come to power and they're, they're changing how we govern ourselves as American citizens. Why do we exist? Ultimately, you know, I look at advocates and we go out and we fight for, for traditional marriage. We fight to preserve religious liberty. We fight to preserve the right to free speech. And why do, we, why do we do all of this? You know, I really believe that ultimately, you know, our nation came to fruition as a Christian nation so that we could be this, this light to the world. And, you know, we go down to Haiti. Um, I've been there three times in the last couple years on, on trips with this uh, group, Haiti Endowment Fund. And it's, it's not something that Advocates does. It's something that I do as a family uh, with my kids. And we go down and we you know, we're have an opportunity to share the gospel, to support what's going on there in, this, in the churches and the schools, to come and bring, you know, uh, they don't have in Haiti, they don't have blackboards. In, in the schools, you, you know, how do you how do you do how do you teach? You don't even have blackboards. It, it, they don't have the basics, and, and so this last trip we went down and we were able to put up lots of lots of blackboards. Still, there's schools that don't have blackboards, and um, and so we go down there and we try to help supply them with with the ability with just basic basic necessities. We, you know, we went to this one 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 church one day, and and you've got all of these. These, these folks, these adults and young people, they don't even have soap. And it was a blessing for us to be able to bring bars of soap, toothpaste, toothbrushes, and they were thrilled. Bars, protein bars, and, and just boxes. And to be able to hand it out and to see their faces and how thankful they were, thankful they were for that. But why, you know, how are we even able to do that? We're able to do that because we're blessed as a nation. We've got funding, we have money. You know, yes, it's it's difficult, but but we're blessed, and uh, and we go out and we do these humanitarian things as a nation, and and for us at Advocates for Faith and Freedom, we look at it and say, you know what, why we exist is because we want to be able to spread the gospel, not only here in our country, but to be able to take it throughout the world, and and we do it by the fact that you just hand out hand some soap out to people, and they're blessed by that, and and you. Have in, in Creole that, you know, says, uh, I, I didn't even know what it said, but it was a scripture verse, you know? <laughs> and he's sharing the gospel. I, I knew what it was. I can't remember what it, was, what, what it said. But it's, you know, it's an amazing thing that what, you know, what, American is, what, what America is and what we've been able to, to accomplish. And we spread the gospel throughout the world. And ultimately, that's really what it comes down to. For us, uh, we exist because we want to defend the First Amendment right to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ here and all over the world. You know, um, let me let me let me just I, I give you tell you about a couple things we have up here. This is a uh, this is a newsletter, and I kind of wrote on this and wrote about Haiti and why why we do it. This this helps to uh, I think in, encapsulate. Um, who we are and, and what we're doing, and now you know. I realize, Lori, is this the is this the the last newsletter? I don't believe it's the last. Oh, okay, I lied. <laughs> I'm defending the First Amendment right to lie. Uh, <laughs> this is not that one, but we have it on our website. But this is a newsletter we send out. Let me tell you real quickly about something else that we've got going. Um, have any of you seen that movie, uh, 2016? That's out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, a few of you. 2016 is this movie that's that's interesting about who Obama is and what what kind what is the what America is Obama trying to establish? And and it is an America, frankly, that is quite contrary to what we have we understand and most of us probably value, to be frank. Um, and this movie 2016 was based upon a, a book called Obama's America that was written by a fellow named Dinesh D'Souza. It's out in the movie theaters right now. Uh, I encourage all of you to see it because it might challenge what you believe is going on in America today. Um, it, it, might, it might actually support what you think is going on in America today. And, and I'd encourage you to go see this. And the, the fellow who, who wrote the book upon which this is based and the fellow who's in the movie is coming to speak at our annual fundraiser called Justice 2012. It's on October 6th. And uh, these are 
invitations that we've got. This is a little some information about it as well. You guys can uh, can come pick that up and pick some of these invitations. It's you know I'll just let me do this. I'll pass these out. You guys can you guys can look at them. How about that? Um, and it's it's a it's a fundraiser that we do. The tickets are one hundred fifty dollars a piece, and I realize that it's I realize that it's expensive, but uh, uh, you know, for us, it's how we fund doing what we do, um, and it is our, our main fundraiser throughout the year. Um, so, you know, I, I wrote down some notes. Why, why, why does advocates exist? You know, it's kind of because the roots of, of Christendom in North America are becoming extinct in the law. They're becoming extinct in the law. What do I mean by that? You know, it, it means that as you probably know, uh, there's this idea of separation of church and state that somehow, you know, the government um, cannot be influenced by the church whatsoever. Somehow that churches should not speak from the pulpit um, endorsing candidates. They shouldn't even talk about anything that is so-called political. And pastors so often have bought into this. They, they say, oh, well, we can't talk about abortion because that's a political issue. What? No, life? That's a social, moral issue. What about same-sex marriage? No, we shouldn't talk about that. What about the economy? Pastors look at it, taxes, and they think, oh, we shouldn't talk about those issues because that's a political issue. Wait a minute. All of this stuff is it, not political. This, these are moral moral issues. And, and you know, there's no single party that, that has a you know, that speaks for the church. The Republicans don't speak for the church. You might, many of you might be offended by that. Oh my gosh, no. The Republicans certainly don't speak for the church when it comes to same-sex marriage or abortion or the economy or taxes. They don't. The, the, the Democrats certainly don't speak for the church either. You know, the Democrats are not the ones that should have a corner on the marketplace of being concerned about the social issues of the day. You know, it, it, the, the media would have you think that, well, the Democrats have that corner. We're concerned about, about welfare. We are concerned about the poor and the ailing and the sick and people with AIDS. The Republicans don't care about it. The Republicans, on the other hand, say, no, 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 we care about them because, you know, we give a hand up. And, 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 and you know, we're not going to suppress them by just continuing welfare. You know, and there's these arguments that go back and forth, and somehow the church is irrelevant in the whole equation. Isn't it? The church should not be irrelevant. We as Christians should not be irrelevant. But, you know, it seems like Christendom is becoming extinct in the law and in the government. We've become irrelevant. It's run by Congress. You're exactly right. <laughs> Congress is irrelevant to some extent, but we've become irrelevant as Christians. We don't want to be that way. And, and why we become irrelevant is because somehow the laws have come to such a perspective that Christians can't have any influence. You have your church, you talk about, you talk about your church inside the four walls of your church, but don't bring it outside because that's just not right. But, um, you know, if the roots of Christendom are in America are are cut off from government, law, and politics, then our nation will fall. It'll fall at the next wind gust like a large tree that loses its root system. It'll, it'll just simply fall. You know, let's, let's go look at our roots. And, and I've got this book that some of you might be surprised about uh, some of the cases from... Some of these cases are hard to even find in our, you know, we pay about $1,500 a month just for our, our, our law library. We, you know, that's a lot of money every month that we have to spend to be able to have access to the law. Because we take on these cases, we got to write our briefs, so it costs us a lot of money. But, you know, some of these cases you can't even get on our law library. They're so old, they're almost extinct. Let me tell you about a case from 1892. Now, this is 100 years after the First Amendment was, was passed. Okay, now some of you have fallen asleep. I'm talking to you about, you know, 100 years ago, talking about cases, talking about law. Please listen to this. 
the, this is the Church of the Holy Trinity versus the United States. This is written by the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and you know what this, what this had to do with? It, there was a law that said it is unlawful for, for anyone to bring foreigners from outside the United States to bring them into the United States for the purpose of labor. Okay? What does that mean? That means it was illegal at the time to basically go out and hire, hire a foreigner to bring them to work in the United States. Now, the idea behind that, that law was, was to prevent really this slave labor kind of thing that was going on. You know, they're bringing the Chinese in and immigrants in to build the railroads across the United States. And, and, and there's some bad conditions that were going on, right? They weren't treated right. And so, so there was this law for the purpose of that. But what happened here is the Church of the Holy Trinity was bringing in a pastor from England. And they were saying, no, you can't do that. Well, the underlying purpose of the law was, was, was good, but wasn't really right in this situation. It wasn't lawful. And, and so what the U.S. Supreme Court said, it said, no purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation. In other words, it doesn't matter what the law says, you know, this written statute. It doesn't matter what that says because you can't have any law that works against religion, in other words. It says state, any, any, let me read, let me just start over again. No purpose of action against religion can be imputed to any legislation, state or national, because this is a religious people. This is a Christian nation. 1892, this Amen. is a Christian nation. And then it goes, and, and it cites other cases. You know, back in that day, it was the Supreme Court of each state that typically determined, that discussed religion. The, the federal courts were basically out of it, saying, hey, each state can establish for itself how it's going to govern itself when it comes to these social and religious issues. Now, let me read from you. Let me read uh, other language that, that this court <clears throat> said. It says, you know, the Declaration of Independence recognizes the presence of the divine in human affairs in these words. Quote, from the Declaration of Independence, it says, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. After several pages of... of of other uh, cases that are being cited, the court concluded, there is no dissonance in these declarations. There is a universal language pervading them all, having one meaning. They, it, it was summarizing our founding documents. It was summarizing the, the Mayflower Compact and, 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 and documents that came into existence in the colonies documents that, that gave Columbus the purpose for going out and finding a new land. The documents that came from the King of England to the pilgrims saying, I want you to go out and go Christianize this nation. After summarizing all of these documents in 1892, the U.S. Supreme Court goes on and says, these documents, they affirm and reaffirm that this is a religious nation. These are not individual sayings, declarations of private persons. They are organic or legal governmental utterances. They speak the voice of the entire people. These and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. Amazing. Let's go back to 1824, just 34 years after our First Amendment was written and added to our Constitution of the United States. <clears throat> Here, in this case, the, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania uh, addressed and, and reaffirmed that this is a Christian nation. It says, um, find you the best part of it. Thus, the wise legislature framed this great body of laws for a Christian country and a Christian people. This is the Christianity of common law, of the common law. And thus, it is, it is undeniably proved that the laws and institutions of this state 
are built on the foundation of reverence for Christianity. No free government, this is, this is the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, no free government now exists in the world unless where Christianity is acknowledged and is the religion of the country. Its foundations are broad and strong and deep. It is the purest, listen to this, talking about Christianity, a government organization, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, it is the purest system of morality, the firmest auxiliary, and the only stable support of all human laws. It, it's based upon Christianity. How, how is that? If, if, you know, if someone tells you you can't legislate morality, okay, well then how, how do you determine morality? What's the basis of, of our laws? I mean, how do you decide what is moral and what is not? There's got to be some guidepost, right? There's got to be something steadfast that decides what is right and what is wrong. It's just a basic principle. I mean, it's, it's basic logic. That is, there's got to be some standard. If there is no standard, then we, a peop we as the people can decide for ourselves whatever is moral and what is not moral. But our Declaration of Independence says that God has given us these inalienable rights. Because he is the standard for which we determine what is right and what is wrong, what is moral, what is not. The Supreme Court of New York in 1811, just a 21 years after the First Amendment was, was adopted and ratified, 21 years. These are people who were around, who voted, because each state had to vote to ratify the First Amendment. These are the people who voted. These are the people who participated in writing the First Amendment. Supreme Court of New York says, we are a Christian people and the morality of the country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity and not upon the doctrines or worship of those imposters, other religions. We are people whose manners and whose morals have been elevated and inspired by means of the Christian religion. And these cases go on and on. You never hear about these cases, do you, in our, in our current school books? And our, you know, the government doesn't talk about them. The Supreme Court of the United States won't talk about them. You know, it's absolutely amazing. The, the, uh, the original Supreme Court Justice, the original chief of the United States Supreme Court, his name was John Jay. He was a Christian. John Jay wrote over and over about the fact that we are a Christian na nation in his writings. Joseph Story was also one of the originals in the U.S. Supreme Court. What Joseph Story wrote about was Joseph Story wrote about the basis and foundation of our laws that they were they were based upon Christianity about based upon the Bible and what he did was he actually wrote a collection of laws that were the foundation for all of the future laws in America principles basic law you know like I said I've got a $1,500 law library I go to well Joseph's story wrote a collection of of, of books probably of you know it's probably a six or seven volume set on laws and that was the basis he it relied upon the Bible and this is what the lawyers would go to when they would go to court to argue on behalf of their clients well now I have to pay fifteen hundred dollars to have an online law library that accesses thousands and thousands upon thousands of volumes of law books, of cases, of, of precedent, because it, it, it's so complicated now. Because we have lost the basics, the simplicity of, of our laws. You know, if you, uh, if you look at our cases now, some of these cases that we're handling, you look and you question, well, where did we go astray? You know, one of the cases, I don't know, I may have mentioned it last time I was here, there was a young man named Chad Farnan, and he's down in Orange County, and he was in high school, and his teacher uh, in the public high school would, would get up and would literally stand on his chair and even stood on his desks to demonstrate his authority in his speaking. And he, he said, he, he would teach these kids in European history about how horrible America is. I mean, 
it, you know, he would talk about how horrible religion is and how horrible the impact religion has had on society. In one case, um, he was talking about the serfdom back in, in Europe, and he says, you know, as a principle, effectively, is what he's trying to teach, is that if you have your Jesus glasses on, mockingly, if you have your Jesus glasses on, you can't see the truth. In other words, Christians are blinded. He, he, would, he would quote Mark Twain, and, and, and he said, you know, what is it that Mark Twain said? Uh, religion was invented when the first con man met the first fool. He would say things like that and just continue to, to um, deride Christianity over and over again. And this is what our kids are growing up with. And, and he wasn't even teaching U U.S. history. He was supposed to be teaching European history. He would talk about things that had nothing to do with European history, same-sex marriage. I, it was, it, it's absolutely wild. And so we go to court, and we, we have to make the argument that this establishment clause is supposed to prevent government from being hostile toward any religion. And although we won in the district court, the Ninth Circuit would not rule in our favor. In fact, what the Ninth Circuit did is it avoided ruling on the case altogether and establishing the principle of law that needed to really be clearly set forth. Instead, what the Ninth Circuit did, we had these two radically liberal judges, instead of ruling like they, the, in the oral arguments, they knew that we, I mean, you can tell. You know, you go to an oral argument by the questions that are being asked, and we, we knew that they agreed with us in our, in our rationale for the law. But they just couldn't rule in our favor, so what they did is they came up with some procedural mechanism to say, well, because there's no case like this that's ever been, never occurred in the United States, um, there's no principle where a school teacher has been held liable. We're going to hold that he's entitled to governmental immunity. Uh. And therefore, we don't have to decide the merits of this case. Case closed. How? What? Yet, just a couple months earlier, you may remember there was a school teacher in Poway Unified School District down in San Diego. He had, he had a banner up in his room. That, that had, it said, in God we trust. Um, it had, um, God bless America, the name of one of our songs that we as kids grew up singing. And, and, and it was sung by the, all of the Congress after 9 11. Yes. <laughs> I don't remember that specifically, but yeah. So what did the night, what happened? The, the school district said, you got to pull that down. And he said, wait a minute, you're going to, discipline me because I've got these, these are mentioned in our founding documents. And, and, and what happened? The Ninth Circuit, just two months prior to ruling in our case, said that this Christian school teacher was violating the Establishment Clause because he was endorsing religion. <laughs> Yet, two months later, they will not rule in our case when you've got a teacher absolutely hostile toward Christianity. That's what, what we're up against. You know, we have a, we've got another ongoing case right now where we have a, a, a pastor and two men from this church were out in Hemet in front of the Department of Motor Vehicles. They were reading, one of them was reading the Bible out loud. And he was, they were there before the business opened, before the Department of Motor Vehicles opened. And you know, there's a lot of people standing there. Now, what he was doing was they were there to proselytize. And they wanted people to hear the Bible. All they were doing was reading the Bible out loud. Now, I'll be honest, it might be annoying to people, and understandably so. It might be that, you know, you might even be a Christian and go, you know, I wouldn't want to share the gospel that way, and I don't think they should be doing it that way. That's, that's, that might not be effective. That might actually harm the cause a little bit. I could understand why you'd say that. I may agree with you, I might not. But what, what is more important is the fact that they were arrested because they were reading the Bible out loud in public. Why? Because they, they didn't want to hear that. And, 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 you know, the First Amendment right to free speech is intended to protect us to be able to do that. Now, if there was a man who was standing there 
who was reading the platform of the Democratic Convention out loud, mm -hmm. do you think he would have been arrested? No. I don't think so. Would have applauded. That, you know, that he has a right to free speech. Which version? <laughs> <laughs> a good example. What happened in the Democratic Convention just two uh, nights ago? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah, if, you, if you haven't heard, they removed God from their platform. And then they were pressured into putting it back in the platform. And our great mayor of Los Angeles was standing up there and, and, and he... He had a motion and and talking about putting the uh, a motion to put God back in the platform and to reference Jerusalem as the as the capital of Israel, mm -hmm. and he was booed in the Democratic convention. You know what? I don't think that those people in that convention necessarily represent the Democrats of America. I really don't. You know, I I think there are plenty of Democrats in this country that are God fearing Christians. But, who, where, who are they following? They're following, they're following a platform that wants to remove God. And as Christians, one of our problems in this country is because we haven't stepped up. You know, and I want to say churches, they've got to wake up and, and, and see these things that are going on. We just recently had, some, uh, had one of our cases being covered by the uh, local news stations, and it's uh, Calvary Chapel Bible Fellowship in the Temecula wine country trying to open the church in the wine country, expand their church in the wine country. And, and, and they have completely banned all churches in the wine country. Why? Churches are not allowed in the wine country. Stop tourism. It's not tourism. It doesn't raise money. It doesn't generate tax revenue. And, and you know what? We met with, uh, we met with one of the, uh, with the leader of the wineries who are up in arms and in opposition. The leader of the winery doesn't want churches out there, and 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 he he asked in a, in a in a private meeting. He says, "Well, what's your doctrine when it comes to wine? Because you know, you know, some people are opposed to wine. Wait a minute. Since when did my doctrine establish whether or not I could open a church in the wine country or not?" Yeah. I don't care if I, I don't care if our church teaches that that alcohol is a sin. That should not prevent us from being able to locate in the wine country. But in fact, it doesn't. And and I, I said, you know, there are a lot of people in this church that drink wine, and they go and they go to these wineries and they have dinner and lunch and they support you. And they just didn't seem to understand that. But it was all about. The fact that this is a conservative Christian church and they're worried and it's just kind of crazy. Um, th there's a neighbor who doesn't want the church there because he's afraid that that church is going to ruin his business somehow. Because on his 20 acre parcel, when, when he overlooks, you know, looks over the rolling hills, there's going to be a church there that he's going to be able to see. Somehow that's going to ruin his business. <laughs> it, you know, and you look at it, you're sitting here probably like, you know, most people that live in this area, you might have, uh, you know, a quarter of an acre that you, that you live on. And your business might sit on an acre if you're lucky, you know. But to talk about 20 acres, doesn't that just kind of blow your mind? 20 acres, mm -hmm. the, the, the building would actually be about 40 acres away. It's, it's, it's where are we in this, in this world? Let me, let, me, let, me talk, let me show you about some of these things that have been going on. Um, recently. Now, this might this might seem very political to you. Um, and let me just say that although I am a Republican, I'm not happy with the Republicans. Yeah. I'm not happy with where they've gotten us. You know, I mean, we had, you know, there there are many years where our nation was taken down by, um, you know, this debt and a lot of problems, and uh, you know, the Republicans didn't necessarily do what they were supposed to do either. Mm -hmm. Democrats didn't either. But right now we're facing an election and, and it's very concerning because unlike any other, I have seen the religious liberty be trampled upon by judges that are appointed by radical liberals. <clears throat> judges that are endorsed by the ACLU and, and people who are anti-Christian. And what concerns me most of all is what's happened in the administration today. And 
oh, I should say, what's happened in the administration in, in Obama's last four years. I'm going to read some of these things to you, and you might be surprised. In 2009, when speaking at Georgetown University, Obama orders that a monogram symbolizing Jesus' Jesus's name be covered when he is making a speech. In May of 2009, Obama declines to host services for a National Day of Prayer, a day established actually by federal law mm -hmm. at, and at the White House. He declined to host the services. In October of 2010, uh, Obama begins deliberately omitting the phrase, the creator, when quoting the Declaration of Independence, something that he did on no less than seven occasions. Wow. Uh, November 2010, Obama says that our national uh, motto is e pluribus unum rather than in God we trust as is established by federal law. In January of 2011 after a federal law was passed to transfer a, a World War II memorial in the Mojave Desert to private ownership um, and the US Supreme Court ruled that the cross could stand, Obama refused to allow the land to be transferred so that the cross could stand. In April 2011 for the first time in American history, uh, Obama urges the passage of a law, it's a non-discrimination law, that would, that would force religious organizations to hire according to these federal mandates without regard to the moral principles of each organization. In other words, if a Christian organization is opposed to same-sex marriage or or it says that homosexuality is, is not right, as most Christian organizations do, they would not be able to discriminate in their hiring in that sense. They would still have to hire qualified homosexuals. Um, in August of, and, and by the way, let me address something real quick. You know, if you're in a business and you have a business, and you know, you're, you're, you're running you know, some construction company, and a, you know, You've got a qualified homosexual carpenter standing in front of you who wants a job. Well, I'd say hire him. Don't discriminate against him. Um, he's not, you know, use him and hopefully you can minister to him. So you shouldn't discriminate irrationally. But when you're talking about a church who has basic foundation Christian principles uh, upon which they are operating, the government shouldn't be able to Amen. say, you have to hire Anybody we tell you, you have to hire. 2011, the Obama administration releases its new health care rules uh, that um, would require medical workers to perform abortions. Hmm. 2011, and of course you know that what's recently happened is the federal mandate that requires Catholic organizations to issue contraceptive, <coughs> contraceptive medicine uh, as part of their health care. Uh, totally against their, their rules and, and their, their principles. November 2011, Obama avoids any religious references in his Thanksgiving Day proclamation, which every president in history thanks God. That was the purpose of Thanksgiving. 2012, uh, the Obama administration argues that the First Amendment provides no protection for churches and synagogues in the hiring of their pastors and rabbis. The Obama administration forgives student loans in exchange for public services, but announces it will no longer forgive student loans if the public service is related, if the public service is related to religion. The Department of Veterans Affairs in 2011 forbids references to God and Jesus during burial ceremonies in the Houston National Ceremony, uh, National um, Cemetery. September 2011, Army uh, at the Wal Walter Reed Medical Center. Uh, says they adopt a new policy that says no religious items are allowed to be given away during any visit inside the medical center. I mean, that almost sounds like communist Russia when I was there in 1987 in Leningrad when you had to hide your Bibles. 2011, Air, Air Force Academy, Air Force Academy rescinds support, I'm not talking, Air Force Academy rescinds support for Operation Christmas Child because it's a Christian program. Air Force Academy pays $80,000, though, to establish a Stonehenge-like worship center for pagans, druids, and witches, and Wiccans. 2012, Air Force removes God from the patch of Rapid Capabilities Office. Of course, just 
And, and you know that they did that in, I, I believe it was the Air Force as well recently when they removed it from the motto. 2009, uh, funding for abortion um, is, is provided internationally when there used to be a prohibition on funding abortion. So we Americans, you know, we never agreed that we should spend money in foreign nations to support abortions, but now those bans are lifted. And in fact, um, Obama gave $50 million to, an, to a UN organization working with the Chinese to help support their one child population. Uh, and, and, over, and, and what they do there, they do sterilizations and abortions. Sterilize women, prohibit them from having a baby after they have one child. Now, I don't understand how that is not a violation of the pro-choice principles that they stand for. There is, in 2009, and I actually have this document, the um, Obama administration through the Homeland Security uh, Office has distributed guidelines for looking for potential terrorists. And their, their guidelines when looking at potential terrorists, they include the these types of characteristics. Christians who believe in prophecy. Whoa. Persons who are anti-abortion, persons who own guns, and who support the Second Amendment. I thought, wow, I, I fit all those. I'm a potential terrorist, according to the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> um, you know, it goes on and on. I, I, honestly, I mean, I've, I've got this, I've got pages and pages of these types of things that have gone on by the by the Obama administration. Last and night in this speech, he said, "I'm quoting the scripture," and then said something that was not at all quoting the scripture. And how can he call himself Christian? And, 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 and we're just we just seem to be so ignorant to that. You know, it, when it when it comes to I, I've got I've got pages here of. Um, of things that the Obama administration has done where his Muslim advisors has prevented Christian uh, Christians from the Middle East coming in to petition help in the White House. Um, it, it just goes on and on in, in, in you know, the favor of Islam and, and Franklin Graham is not invited to the Pentagon, Pentagon's National Day of Prayer because the Muslims would be upset. Um, so it you know it just it just goes on and on and of course you know President Obama evolved and decided that you know now he's in favor of same sex marriage. Will you make sure uh, Ronnie has a copy of that? Uh, absolutely, <laughs> we can we can do that. Can yeah, definitely. Email we'll be here too. People. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Here's a, here's a good here's a good way to do this. If you sign up, we'll email it to you. This is our mail. We've got a mailing list. We'll email it out to all of you. I'll just pass this around. If, if that works, mm -hmm. if you if you want to be on it, and we we'll, we'll get you this information, and we'll send you out a, a, an email, kind of an update on what what's going on, some of these things. Um, our case is how you can pray for us um, to help inform you because we as a nation we need to be informed about these things. Amen. Um, we send we, we you know we won't barrage you with a ton of emails about one an hour. That's all we do. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like the Obama campaign. Yeah. We send out, you know, we'll send out emails uh, when necessary and usually about once a week. And uh, try to keep you updated. And, uh, you know, just appreciate your support in, in trying to help us on these things. You know, the bottom line is our nation, boy, it, we are, we are in this radical state of affairs. Yes. Yeah. We've got we've got unemployment that is is just out the roof, and underemployment. You know I, what are the estimates that you know when you really take a look at those who are underemployed, meaning people who are working part time and really want full time jobs, and those who are unemployed. I mean, we're probably at twenty five percent. Wow. We have we have an economy that's struggling. We, you know we're on the verge of 
of potential catastrophe, they say. Our debt is, is astronomical. And, and so, many, so many difficult things. You know, we're, we're, we're trying to deal with families where you know, we want to raise our kids right. And, and, and kids are, you know, the, you know, they're having abortions, they're, they're getting diseases, the AIDS, they are, the, the, the kids, honestly, I mean, kids are irreverent to their parents. They, they, you know, how many times have you just gone to a McDonald's and wondered, who raised that kid? Um, you know, there's a lot of difficult things going on in society today. And, you know, and I, I'd ask you, what happens when your air conditioner breaks? Like today? <laughs> yeah. What happens, what happens when your computer or your car isn't working right, and you don't know how to fix it? Call someone. You, you go to the manual. We do it the old-fashioned way, right? Nowadays, you go to YouTube, and you say, how do I fix my air conditioner? But, you know, you go, to the, you go back to the manual on, on how this circuitry is designed. You go back to see, okay, how do I operate this? And, you know, that's where our country's at right now. We're at this stage where, how do we fix this? How, and, and you know what? The, the guide for troubleshooting basically says, we need to go back to our principles upon which our nation was founded. Amen. Amen. We need to go back to reverencing Christianity and the values of Christianity. That is what has made our nation great. That is what it has instilled a work ethic in our in our in our citizenry over the years. It, it has the moral principles that are that are clearly established of right and wrong. We don't have to question what, what is right or what is wrong. We just have to go to the Bible because that's our manual. Amen. 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 And, you know, I look at that and I just see where we're at today. I, you know, I don't know if Romney will, will go to his Bible or any Bible. I, I would hope he would. But I do know that Obama is not. Yeah. And you know they might they might tell me, well, wait a minute, you guys are a nonprofit organization. You shouldn't be endorsing uh, or supporting any candidate. Well, you know what? I, as most pastors should be doing, I'm telling you that what what President Obama has done has been anti-Christian yeah, and anti-religious liberty. And I'm telling you that I need to go and vote for somebody who is in favor of religious liberty. I want a country that's going to support our religious liberty so we can continue taking it out Amen. throughout the nations. Yeah. Um, and I hope that uh, you know this message would get across and and you would do the same and, and share it with people. And this is not intended to be a, you know, I'm here to uh, talk about politics. Really what I'm here to talk about is, you know, we've got a great problem in this nation and there is a solution. We just got to go back to the manual. Um, just want to address, have you address the question? Um, you're working with law. Seems like in our country, law is being set aside, um, and whatever is right in the eyes of whoever has the power does whatever, either impose, enforce the law, or does not enforce the law with no consequences whether they do or not. What how do you how do you handle what do you think if if law isn't foundational, if law isn't set in stone and enforced, mm -hmm. then what good is it? What as a lawyer, what's happening here? <laughs> well let me give you a good example of uh, to to you know, give you a good example of what's going on with the problem. Now, by the way, if anybody needs to leave, you please feel free to get up and leave because we're running a little behind. And I'll take questions. Um, you know, what's happening, it, it, a good example was the same-sex marriage case in California in federal court. And we were in front of a judge who was homosexual. Now, this federal judge did not disclose that he was a homosexual and he hid it intentionally until after he retired. Now, we had a feeling and kind of knew there were some rumors, but of course the media would never address that. And we had to be careful not to address it because we didn't have any hard evidence. And, and so what this judge did, he was so biased against our case, 
And when we were in federal court in San Francisco, it was a mockery in the system. Mm -hmm. It was embarrassing to be standing there in a federal court where normally, when I come in, I wear a dark suit. I never wear a gray suit. You got to wear a dark suit. You've got to wear a white shirt. You, you know, there's just a certain way about federal court, very reverent. But it, the, this judge made a mockery out of the system, like it could have been on some half-hour, you know, sitcom. And, you know, he would mock our expert witnesses, and the whole courtroom would bust up laughing in the back, and they'd be, you know, you'd look, and everyone's ah raising their hand and slapping each other on the back, and I mean, you just don't do that in federal court. But that is what happened. And, and then what happened is this judge issued a ruling that was so contrary to law. He invented a new right in the Constitution and said, there is a right to same-sex marriage that I read into the Constitution, effectively, is what he did. And of course, there's absolutely no legal basis for that. When you look at our history and you look at our precedent, it's very easy to say, I don't care if you're in favor of same-sex marriage or not. There's no legal precedent to allow that and say that, or, or there's no legal precedent to say that the people of California cannot limit marriage to one man and one woman. If, if the federal judge, or excuse me, if the people of California wanted to vote and, and adopt same-sex marriage, they have that right also. But this federal judge completely created a new rule, a new law. He legislated from the bench. He, over, he reversed all the people. So what do you do with that? We appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's where we're at. Uh, in about two weeks, the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be deciding uh, whether or not it's going to take some of these cases. You know, the Ninth Circuit sustained the, this judge's decision and said same-sex marriage the prohibition on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional. So now we're asking the U.S. Supreme Court to hear the case, and there's a couple other cases from around the country that are asking the U.S. Supreme Court to do the same in their instances. What happens if the U.S. Supreme Court does not abide by the law and, and rule as it should and say, no, the people have that right? What's the next step? Uh, you know, well, there's, there's, there's two things that could happen. One, we get so mad a, as, as a people, and we vote and say no. No single judge should be able to steal our vote. Yeah. No single judge should be able to steal democracy from us, because that is what he's doing. Right. He is stealing democracy. He's taking it away as though he were the king of England, which is what... The revolutionaries saw happening, and what did they do? They rose up in arms mm -hmm. and overtook the government and, and created their own government, established the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, are we going to get to some point in our nation where that's what we're going to have to do? Well, it, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, I, it, it's scary to think. But, you know, it would be a lot easier if Christians and people of faith would just simply vote. And if they voted, we wouldn't have these radical judges because if we voted based upon our biblical <coughs> principles, we would have people in office who have reverence for, for our Christian faith and the foundations of morality, and they would not appoint judges like this. They would appoint judges who are rational, reasonable, and not totally ideologically driven. And, and that's a judge's job, is to rule based upon law, not their own ideology. But we've, things have turned around, and they've been given, they, that's what they're doing.